Uh, hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, this is the first public lecture by the Center for the Study of Existential Risk, um, a new institute which will be studying um, the risks, the most dangerous risks arising from new technologies uh, developed over the next century. Uh, I'm Benjamin Todd, the executive director and co-founder of 80,000 Hours, uh, which is co-hosting this event along with Giving What We Can. Um, 80,000 Hours is a nonprofit based in Oxford which provides online research and one-on-one -on -one coaching to talented young graduates on the best strategies and opportunities for making a difference with their careers. And we're part of and help to start uh, what's now a growing global social movement called Effective Altruism, uh, which is based around the idea of using um, evidence and reason to work out how best to make the world a better place. Um, so how does that relate to tonight? Um, one of the things we encourage people to do when choosing a career to make a difference is make sure they work on the right cause. Um, so you can have all the influence in the world, but if you direct it into the wrong problem, uh, you're not going to achieve as much as you could. And you know, we think some causes are more important than others. Um, I'm a fan of donkeys as much as the next man, but I think that the work of the Against Malaria Foundation fighting malaria is more important than the work of the Donkey Sanctuary which is a very well-funded charity which brings donkeys from Eastern Europe um, and who have been working their whole lives and sends them to a sanctuary in the English countryside to recover. Um, so some causes can be more important than others, but also a cause can be important but not tractable or there's already a lot of people working on it and that also means it's not as promising. So we encourage people to find problems to work on which are important, tractable and uncrowded, they're neglected. Um, and that's what brings us to uh, Caesar, which um, it's hard to imagine um, a more promising area to be working on. Um, it was in 1939 that Einstein wrote to uh, Roosevelt uh, a letter which contained the phrase, it is conceivable that extremely powerful bombs of a new type may be constructed. And he was referring, of course, to nuclear weapons. And just six years later, these weapons were real and they'd been deployed in uh, Japan. And uh, not long after that, the American and Soviet governments gained the ability to end civilization for the first time. And that was um, an existential risk, uh, a risk which threatens our very long-term uh, potential and future. And this is the kind of risks that this group has set up to study. There's a, a number of new technologies which maybe have, um, well, we're not sure, have similar potential or even worse potential than nuclear weapons to cause harm, uh, which will rise over the next century. Um, so this work is highly important because um, there's whole future generations at stake. Uh, but at, at the same time, there's hardly a community of 20 researchers in the world working explicitly on, systematically on these issues, uh, mainly based at the Future of Humanity Institute in Oxford and several um, at the Machine Intelligence Research Institute in, in Berkeley. And it just seems uh, that the level of um, investment into this cause is completely out of out of kilter with the importance of these issues. Um, and this is why we're incredibly excited uh, for the launch of um, this research group. Uh, what have we been doing about this? Well, we've been helping young people use their careers to work on these issues, and we think there's a lot of ways that uh, we can contribute. So uh, an alumni of 80,000 Hours um, has, been, uh, has funded a quarter of the uh, Institute's uh, budget to date. Um, he was just a young guy who went to take a job in finance and is donating over half of his salary to charity. And at just age 25, he's already played a major part in uh, launching a research institute, which is a pretty incredible accomplishment. Um, several other 80,000 Hours alumni uh, have been working to set up the Global Priorities Institute in Oxford, which uh, does related research and has also been talking to policymakers at number 10 about some of these issues and has presented a policy document about existential risk. So we're hoping that we can help see that some of this research sees practical application in policy. And finally, we're hoping that we can encourage some of the most talented young researchers of a generation, of our generation, to work on these issues in their careers. So if you'd like to find out more about 80,000 Hours, um, please come talk to me after the event or talk to Jacob there. Do you want to quickly raise your hand? And if you'd like to find out more about our events in Cambridge, tick the feedback form which is on your chair and fill out your email address.
Okay, so now I'm going to turn over to the three co-founders of Caesar. Um, the final speaker, I'll introduce them in reverse order. So the final speaker is going to be Jan Tallinn, who's the co-founder of Skype uh, and the co-founder of Kazaar, which at one time was the most trafficked site on the internet, um, as well as Metamed. And he's one of the leading philanthropists in the world who works on uh, funding uh, research and other work to reduce existential risk. Um, the second speaker is going to be Lord Martin Rees, who's uh, the Astronomer Royal, has written over 500 journal articles, and has written one of the first books uh, popularizing the idea of existential risk, which is called Our Final Century. And the first speaker is uh, Hugh Price, who's the Bertrand Russell Professor of Philosophy at Cambridge, and played a major role in bringing these three speakers together to set the Institute up. And so now I'm going to hand over to him to tell the story of um, how Caesar was started. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Bill. Thank you, Sean. Um, well, thank you, Ben, um, and welcome all. And thank you very much to 80,000 Hours and giving what we can for hosting this wonderful event. As Ben mentioned, um, I've recently become the Bertrand Russell Professor of Philosophy in, in the Faculty of Philosophy just across the way here. Um, I've only been in the job for about two and a half years. I was making my way here late in the summer of 2011 for the first time. I, I was coming from Sydney, taking a rather circuitous route via Scandinavia and various other places in Northern Europe. And one evening in Copenhagen, I found myself in a taxi with a man I'd never met before. We hadn't met, but I knew who he was because we were attending the same conference and there'd been an introductory session at the beginning of the conference two days before at which everyone had a couple of minutes to say who they were, and I'd noticed that this man was there. He got up and said his name was Jan Tallinn, made a joke about coming from a place with the same name, and then said that he was one of the founders of Skype. Now, I'm, I'm sure some of you can, um, remember, uh, can imagine some of the thoughts that went through my mind when I, I realized I was in the back of a taxi with one of the founders of Skype. Thoughts like, I wish I was on Twitter, that kind of thing. <laughs> But, I mean, lacking any immediate social media to hand, I, I had to fall back on conversation. And so I, I introduced myself to Jan, and, and as, as an opener, asked him the, the obvious question. It's probably his least favorite question, i.e. the question as to what he does these days, um, since founding Skype, as it were. Um, and Jan mentioned his, his day job with a, a venture capital company, but said that, he spent a lot of his time trying to raise awareness around the world about what he called AI risk. And I asked him what he meant. And he talked about concerns that machine intelligence might far, at some point, far exceed human intelligence, perhaps relatively soon, and perhaps very rapidly, once machine intelligence becomes self-improving. And that this might be very bad news indeed for many species on this planet including, of course, us. Um, I think Jan said that on his pessimistic days, he thought that he had a higher chance of dying in some AI-related accident than of dying of heart disease or cancer. That's a sort of way of emphasizing how immediate he thought some of these issues were. Now, I'd heard of these issues before, of course, um, but I'd never actually met anyone in person who, who thought a lot about them or cared a lot about them, and especially someone with his feet so firmly on the ground in the software industry, as Jan is. So I, I, I was intrigued, um, both by the ideas themselves, as, as Jan described them, and by Jan's evident commitment to trying to do something about them. So he wasn't wasting this accidental cab ride, obviously. He was trying to convert the, the person that he found sharing the cab with him. 
Well, we had another opportunity to talk a couple of days later, later in the conference. And then it happened that I was spending a couple of days in Tallinn, just two weeks later, um, after giving some lectures in Helsinki. It turned out that at that point, the, the, the easiest way to get from Helsinki to Cambridge was to take the ferry t over to Tallinn, an hour away on the other side of the Gulf of Finland, and to fly on EasyJet to Stansted from there. So that was what I was proposing to do with all, all, all my luggage from Sydney, which had been accompanying me around Scandinavia. So I emailed Jan. I realized there was, a, there was a chance we could meet again. I emailed him and asked him whether he was going to be around when I was in Tallinn and suggested that if so, then perhaps we could have a coffee or something like that. And by that stage, it had already occurred to me that one of the people I already knew in Cambridge was also very concerned with possible near-term technological risks to humanity. And that person, of course, was Martin Rees, who was then still master of Trinity College, where I was about to take up a fellowship. I knew Martin through philosophy of cosmology circles, among other ways, and we'd met at another conference, actually, just a couple of years previously. So the possibility that had occurred to me was that, thanks to this accidental cab ride in Copenhagen, I might be in a position to act as a catalyst between these two distinguished activists and, and their respective kind of networks, Cambridge on the one hand and all the sorts of people that Jan knows on the other. And it, I had the thought that the resulting reaction, if I could act as a catalyst in this way, might be even more effective in raising awareness about these issues than the two individual voices could possibly be acting alone. And it occurred to me that this would be an especially fitting role for the new Bertrand Russell professor to play. As most of you will know, Russell himself spent a lot of time in the last 20 years of his long life trying to reduce the risks of human extinction from nuclear weapons, the case that Ben mentioned. I'll come back to that activity later on. Well, I discussed these thoughts um, with Jan over a, a long lunch in Tallinn and set out for Cambridge, even more gripped by the thought that fate was offering me a remarkable opportunity. She'd already been very generous to me in lining me up with what, from my point of view, was the best job in the world. And now she seemed to be offering me a chance to use that job to do something fascinating entirely unexpected and perhaps rather important. So when I got to Cambridge, I spoke to Martin about what I was then calling ambiguously my Tallinn project, um, and with Martin's encouragement, set about looking for an effective way to bring Jan to Cambridge so that um, Jan and, and Martin could meet. Happily, I soon encountered the uh, Center, for Science and Center for Science and Policy, CSAP, whose director, David Cleveley, assured me that CSAP organized the best public lectures in Cambridge and offered to host one for Jan. And that lecture took place at the beginning of February 2012, just over two years ago, and that was the first opportunity for the three of us to get together. And by the spring of that year, a few weeks later, we decided to work together to establish what at that stage we agreed to call the Center for the Study of Existential Risk, or CESA. Let me say something about the focus of our project, the focus of Caesar. We decided to concentrate explicitly on catastrophic or potentially species-threatening risks arising from unintended consequences of new human technologies. Now, of course, there are other um, extinction-level risks, both human-made, as in the case of nuclear weapons, and natural, as in the case of asteroid impacts. But these risks, well, at least the asteroid impact one, are comparatively low, they're constant, and they're comparatively well understood. In contrast, we felt the potential technological risks, say from biotechnology or nanotechnology or from AI itself, might be considerably higher, rapidly changing, and hardly studied at all. As Ben says, there are perhaps 20 people in the world working directly on these issues. Although there are many distinguished people concerned about them, scattered among other academic disciplines. So it seemed obvious where we should focus our efforts on the case of new risks arising from new technologies. Well, there are various strategies for establishing an academic center. 
One very common approach goes something like this. You simply stand with your idea at one end of the runway <laughs> and start running in the hope that you'll be able to assemble a serviceable aircraft with all that that takes before you get to the takeoff zone. Now, not everyone makes it, of course, but in this case, I felt from the beginning that our chances were very good. Martins and Jan's distinction meant that we already had plenty of lift at our disposal, and the need for and rough shape of the craft we were building was never in doubt. We, we, we had our core theme right from the beginning. Now, of course, we needed a lot of thrust to accelerate to take off velocity, but for this, we've been able to rely on the reputations of a growing group of very distinguished people inside and outside Cambridge, inside and outside academia, who've generously agreed to lend us their names by joining our advisory board. Another piece of good fortune we had in the early stages was encountering the university's excellent Center for Research in Arts, Social Sciences and Humanities, CRASH. Like a, a mother hen or perhaps a mother ship, CRASH took us under their wing at an early stage as we worked to, as it were, to build our own wings. Um, and that's been a very, um, very helpful relationship indeed. It's difficult to say at what point exactly we left the ground, Some, somewhere over the last six or seven months or so. Perhaps there were a few hops there at the beginning. But we're certainly in the air now, and one of the marks of that is our growing visibility and reputation, leading in turn to such things as a growing advisory role, both to government agencies and in the private sector, and both in Britain and elsewhere. We have a growing role as a sponsor and co-organizer of various meetings and workshops, and a growing ne network of uh, international researchers. From the beginning, we've also had close links to the Future of Humanity Institute uh, in Oxford that Ben also mentioned. And perhaps most important of all, we've had a growing influence on the conversation, helping to put the issue of extreme technical, technological risk on the agenda for discussions in various fora around the world, helping it to become, as it needs to be, a mainstream topic rather than a fringe topic. But what topic is it exactly? One thing that's come into focus over the past 20 months or so, as we've worked to get Caesar into the air, is a way of defining the space of tasks in which it needs to operate. And I like to put it like this. Insofar as we can extrapolate from our own case, it seems likely that any advanced tool-using species is going to face a new kind of challenge when its technology reaches a certain point. Roughly the task of ensuring that it doesn't wipe itself out with its own technological success. The danger stems from the fact that powerful technologies may put the capacity to do catastrophic damage in dangerously few hands, or perhaps dangerously few few claws or, or tentacles or whatever the relevant appendages might be. Or in the hands of other intelligences altogether in the case of artificial intelligence. But that means that there's a, a generic question that any such species seems likely to face at roughly this point, roughly our point in its development. What new techniques and scientific tools does it need to develop to manage and as far as possible to mitigate such risks? What are the necessary ingredients, theoretical and practical, of, of what we might call a science of existential risk? I see these questions as being the most concise summary of Caesar's concerns. Caesar's role is to lead and foster the development of this new and necessary science. We don't know yet quite how urgent the task is in our own species case, but there are enough grounds for concern that it seems prudent to begin to develop the techniques and expertise to find out, and that's what we aim to do here. And that brings me back to Russell. I mentioned earlier that Russell spent much time and energy in the last 20 years of his life in the campaign against the spread and dangers of nuclear weapons. Here he is, for example, taking part in a sit-in in, in, in Whitehall um, in mid-February 1961, at the age, I think, of 88, and keep in mind that winters were colder in those days. Here's Russell sitting on the ground in Whitehall. Later that year, at the age of 89, in another such sit-in, he was uh, arrested 
He spent a, a week in Brixton Prison, the, the same prison he'd been locked up in during the First World War, after refusing to sign a good behaviour bond to say that he wouldn't do it again. Uh, here's a contemporary comment on that. A few years, bef a few years before this, that, in, um, so this was 1961, a few years before that, um, at Christmas 1954, Russell had delivered a famous BBC lecture on the dangers of the H-bomb. He later wrote out that lecture by hand uh, um, in order that a copy of it could be deposited in the Trinity College Library. And when I first joined Trinity a couple of years ago, it was on display in the Wren Library in a case next to a letter by the Trinity physicist Otto Frisch descri describing the first um, atomic test, of which he was an, eye uh, an eyewitness. And I looked at Russell's letter again recently and realized that if we take a bit of liberty with Russell's meaning, we can read him as anticipating the need that Caesar is trying to meet. So I want to, read, I want to finish by reading you the first page of Russell's letter. Here it is, um, written out by him at, uh, in his 80s in uh, a rather lovely green ink, which doesn't show up very well in this copy. Russell says, I am speaking on this occasion not as a Briton, not as a European, not as a member of a Western democracy, but as a human being, a member of the species man whose continued existence is in doubt. The world is full of conflicts, Jews and Arabs, Indians and Pakistanis, white men and Negroes in Africa, and overshadowing all, overshadowing all minor conflicts, the titanic struggle between communism and anti-communism. Almost everybody who's politically conscious has strong feelings about one or more of these issues, Russell says. But I want you, if you can, to set, set, such feelings for, um, set aside such feelings for the moment and consider yourself only as a member of a biological species which has had a remarkable history and whose disappearance none of us can desire. I shall try to say no single word which would appeal to one group rather than to another. All equally are in peril, and if the peril is understood, there is a hope that they may collectively avert it. And then in the very last sentence on this first page of the letter, Russell says, we have to learn to think in a new way. Now, now what Russell had in mind here, of course, as he goes on to say on the next page, was a new way of thinking about the way we conduct international relations to reduce the threat of nuclear war. And we have something different in mind, of course. Uh, so what we have in mind is a new way of thinking about the potential risks of our own technological success. But the goal is the same in both cases, namely to save ourselves from the consequences of our own technological ingenuity. That's our project, um, and we think that there's nowhere better than Cambridge to be doing it. Thank you. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Martin, who's going to be followed by Jan, um, and they're going to tell you something more about these risks that we're trying to avert. Um, well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, Hugh Price has set the scene, and uh, Ben mentioned how I came to this subject uh, through a book which I wrote ten years ago, which I entitled Our Final Century? The publishers left out the question mark. <laughs> and then the American publishers retitled the book Our Final Hour. Um, <laughs> Americans like instant gratification and the reverse. Well, my theme in that book was that the Earth has existed for 45 million centuries. As an astronomer, I know that. But this century is special. It's the first when one species, ours, has the Earth's future in its hands. Over nearly all of the Earth's history, threats have come from nature. Disease, earthquakes, floods, asteroids, and so forth. But the worst now come from us. And these will become more threatening in coming decades. We're deep into a new geological era called the Anthropocene. And the threats seem to be then of two kinds. First, those stemming from the collective impact of the world's growing population on the biosphere and the climate. 
And second, those that could be caused by rather few people for misuse by error or by design of ever more powerful technology. Bertrand Russell rightly campaigned against thermonuclear weapons. At any time in the Cold War era, when stockpiles escalated beyond all reason, the superpowers could have stumbled towards Armageddon through muddle or miscalculation. The threat of global annihilation involving tens of thousands of H-bombs is thankfully now in abeyance. But there is, though, more reason to worry that smaller nuclear arsenals might be used in a regional conflict, or even by terrorists. But we can't rule out, later in this century, a geopolitical realignment leading to a standoff between new superpowers. So a new generation may face its own Cuba, and one that could be handled less well or less luckily than the 1962 crisis was. And Kennedy is claimed to have said at one stage during that crisis that the odds were between evens and one in three. The H-bomb stemmed from 20th century science. But we should now be anxious, in fact, I think even more anxious, about powerful 21st century technologies. IT and biotech have transformed the way we live and enhanced the lives of billions, but they will have a dark side. And we're already getting more vulnerable. We're already dependent on elaborate networks, electric power grids, air traffic control, international finance, just-in-time delivery, globally dispersed manufacturing, and so forth. And unless these globalized networks are highly resilient, their manifest benefits could be outweighed by catastrophic, albeit rare, breakdowns. London will be paralyzed without electricity. Supermarket shelves will be empty within a day or two if supply chains were disrupted. There are benefits from living in an inter interconnected world, but the downside is that breakdowns or disruptions can cascade globally. Air travel can spread a pandemic worldwide within days, causing the gravest havoc in the shambolic of burgeoning megacities of the developing world. And social media can spread panic and rumor and psychic and economic contagion literally at the speed of light. We're vulnerable to maliciously triggered events as, as well as those arising from error or accidental breakdown. And it worries me that the expertise for increasingly sophisticated bio or cyber attacks will become accessible to millions. This doesn't require large special purpose facilities like making nuclear bombs. Cyber sabotage efforts like Stuxnet, Stuxnet and frequent hacking of financial institutions already have pushed these concerns up the agenda. And in fact, a recent report from the Pentagon Science Board identified six levels of sophistication and even claimed that the sixth level state-engineered cyber attacks could be catastrophic enough to justify a nuclear response. It's scary that they should say that sort of thing. Those of us with cushioned lives in the developed world fret too much about minor hazards. Improbable air crashes, carcinogens in food, low radiation doses, and so forth. I see David Spiegelhardt is here. He talks a great deal of sense to try and make people see these in proportion. But we are less secure than we think. We and our political masters are in denial about these catastrophic risks. They could be triggered as suddenly as the 2008 financial crisis, or they could develop insidiously. The worst have thankfully not yet happened. Indeed, they probably won't. But if an event's potentially catastrophic, it's worth paying a substantial premium to safeguard or insure against it, even if it is unlikely just as we take out fire insurance on our house and don't feel it's wasted money if our house doesn't burn down. The government actually maintains a comprehensive risk register on which global pandemics and cyber threats rate highest in terms of impact multiplied by likelihood. 
But the trends in coming decades scare me even more. So a word about these. But this is a tentative word. Tentative because scientists have a rotten record as forecasters. Lord Rutherford, the greatest nuclear physicist of his time, said in the 1930s that nuclear energy was moonshine. And one of my predecessors as astronomer royal said in the 1950s that space travel was utter bilge. <laughs> so my own crystal ball is very cloudy. I'm an astronomer, not an astrologer. <laughs> Nevertheless, some trends can be forecast with confidence. The world may be more crowded in coming decades. Its population is very likely to have risen from 7 billion today to 8.5 billion or more by mid-century. And half of the world's population will be in Asia. Of course, it's there that the world's intellectual and economic capital will be increasingly concentrated. We're seeing the end of four centuries of European and American hegemony. And we should worry about the burgeoning environmental impact of a growing population needing food and energy. A problem aggravated because hopefully those in the developing world are going to close the consumption gap with the more fortunate amongst us. And these pressures will be heightened because the world's going to be warmer. Though we can't forecast by how much and how threatening climate change will be by then. The main concern, climate-wise, in my view, is the small risk of a runaway worst case rather than the consequences of the median IPCC projections. Ecological shocks could irreversibly degrade our biosphere. These sustainability issues are familiar, but so also is the inaction in dealing with them. To put it simply, the inaction stems from the tendency in all democracies for the urgent to trump the long term and the parochial to trump the global. And I'm equally anxious, more so really, by a second type of threat, which isn't discussed so much. This is the technology will get so powerful that even individuals could trigger global catastrophes. We can't be sure what the greatest advances are going to be. The iPhone would have seen magic even 20 years ago, so looking 50 years ahead, we must keep our minds open, or at least ajar, to what may seem science fiction today. Within a few decades, millions will have the capability to misuse rapidly advancing biotech, just as they can misuse cybertech today. The physicist Freeman Dyson, in an article in the New York Review of Books, foresees a time when children will be able to design and create new organisms, just as routinely as his generation played with chemistry sets. Well, I suspect this idea is comfortably beyond the science fiction fringe. But if even part of his scenario were to come about, our ecology and even our species surely would not survive unscathed. Indeed, you may remember that just last year, some researchers who'd shown that it was surprisingly easy to make the influenza virus more virulent and more transmissible, were pressured to redact some details of their publication. Some say that we can guard against such risks by regulation. 30 years ago, regulation might have worked. But these subjects are so competitive, so globalized, and so driven by commercial pressures that anything that can be done will be done somewhere, whatever the regulations say. It's like trying to control drugs. Drug laws don't work. And another topic, robotics and machine learning. These are advancing apace. Back in the 1990s, IBM's Deep Blue beat the world chess champion, Kasparov. More recently, the Watson computer won a, won a TV game show. But the advances are patchy. And Jan Tallinn knows more about this than me. Robots can't yet recognize and move the pieces on a real chessboard as a deputy as a child can. We can't have robots to uh, um, do things like tie our shoelaces or cut our toenails. Later this century, however, there may be robots that can relate to their surroundings and to people 
as adeptly as we do. This will raise challenging ethical issues. Should we be concerned about them? Do we have responsibilities to ensure they're not underemployed or bored? Moreover, we may need to confront some science fiction scenarios. Dumb autonomous robots going rogue, or a network that could develop a mind of its own and threaten us all. And Jan Talian will be saying more about that. If we can one day augment our brains by silicon implants, the next step might be to download our thoughts and memories into a machine. Future I'll just like Ray Kurzweil talk with a straight face about an era when humans can transcend biology. He even thinks that some people now living could attain immortality, perhaps by abandoning their bodies and having their brains downloaded. In old-style spiritualist parlance, they would go over to the other side. You may have seen there was an article about Kurzweil in The Observer last Sunday. He's in his 60s, and he takes 150 pills a day because he hopes he'll survive long enough taking these pills until these techniques for life enhancement will allow him to live forever. But as a fallback, he's paid for his body to be frozen so he can be revived later. And incidentally, um, there are some people who are doing that. And uh, I had an interview with some of these cryed, they're called cryonics people in California. And I upset them because I said, I'd rather end my days in an English churchyard than a California refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> and they call me a deathist, very old fashioned. <laughs> um, turning now to another topic of futurology what's our future in space? Later this century, I think groups of pioneers may establish habitats on Mars or maybe on asteroids. The first people on Mars will go with one way tickets. They won't find it comfortable but we should welcome these outposts as an assurance that at least a few humans would survive even the worst conceivable terrestrial catastrophes. And whatever ethical constraints we impose here on the ground, we should surely wish them good luck in genetically modifying their progeny to adapt to an alien environment. And this might be the first step towards divergence into a new species. The post-human era could begin within a couple of centuries. By the way, since I'm an astronomer, people think I worry especially about asteroid impacts. I don't. As Hugh said, they're a natural phenomenon, and the risk is better quantified and better understood than, for instance, earthquakes and volcanoes. And by the end of a century, we should be able to reduce this risk by deflecting the orbits of those that might endanger us. And the asteroid risk is not getting any bigger it's no bigger for us than it was for the Neanderthals. And it's swamped, in my perspective at least, by novel risks, especially those stemming from the high-tech empowerment of individuals or small groups. The global village will have its village idiots, and they'll have global range. For instance, there are eco-extremists who think it would be better for Gaia if there were far fewer humans. What happens when such people have mastered the techniques of synthetic biology that will be widespread by 2050? In a future era of vast individual empowerment, when even one malign or careless act could be too many, there will be pressures for more intrusion and less privacy to safeguard ourselves. Indeed, the surprisingly muted response to the recent Snowden revelations suggests that such pressures might meet surprisingly little resistance. Well, these novel 21st century threats, looking a few decades ahead, bio, cyber and AI, could be as devastating as the kind of massive nuclear exchange that could have occurred in the Cold War. Certainly far more scary than the worst things on our government's current risk register. They could present serious, even catastrophic setbacks to our civilization. But they wouldn't wipe us all out. They're, strictly speaking, not existential. So are there conceivable events that could threaten the entire Earth and snuff out all life? Promethean concerns of this kind were raised by scientists working on the atomic bomb during the Second World War. 
Could we be absolutely sure, for instance, that a nuclear explosion wouldn't ignite all the world's atmosphere or oceans? Before the first bomb test in New Mexico, Hans Bethe and two colleagues were asked to address this issue. They convinced themselves that it was a large safety factor. And we now know for certain that a single nuclear weapon, devastating though it is, can't trigger this kind of nuclear chain reaction. But what about even more extreme and more recent experiments? Physicists were, in my view, quite rightly, pressured by the media to address the speculative existential risks that could be triggered by powerful accelerators, which generate unprecedented concentrations of energy. Could physicists unwittingly convert the entire Earth into particles called strangelets, or even worse, trigger a phase transition that would rip apart the fabric of space itself? Fortunately, reassurances could be offered. But I wrote a paper on this subject because it was pointed out that cosmic ray collisions of much higher energies occur frequently in the galaxy, but haven't ripped space apart. And cosmic rays have penetrated dense stars without triggering a strange catastrophe. But physicists should surely be circumspect and precautionary about carrying out experiments that generate conditions with no precedent, even in the cosmos. Just as biologists should avoid release of potentially devastating genetically modified pathogens. And by the way, the priority that we should assign to avoiding these truly existential risks, even when their probability seems almost infinitesimal, depends on a philosophical and ethical question, which is this. Consider two scenarios. Scenario A wipes out 90% of humanity. Scenario B wipes out 100%. How much worse is B than A? Some would say 10% worse. The body count is 10% higher. But others would say that B was incomparably worse because human extinction forecloses the existence of billions, even trillions of future people and indeed of an open-ended post-human future. Well, if you accept the latter viewpoint, you'll agree that existential catastrophes, even if you'd bet a billion to one against them, deserve more attention than they're getting. Moreover, we shouldn't be complacent that all such probabilities will be so minuscule. We've no grounds for assuming that human-induced threats, worse than those on our current risk register, are improbable. They're newly emergent, we have a limited time base for exposure to them. And we can't be sanguine that we'd survive them for long. And we have, I think, zero grounds for confidence that we can survive the worst that future technologies could bring in their wake. Some that have been envisaged may indeed be science fiction, but others may become disquietingly real. Technology brings with it great hopes, but also great fears. We mustn't forget an important maxim, the unfamiliar, is not the same as the improbable. Finally, how does this topic relate to the aims of ATK Hours, the group that's sponsoring us here tonight? Well, if you share our view that more should be done to assess and then minimize these extreme risks, you would want to ask what's the most effective thing to do. John Tallinn will say a bit more about this. But I think it's clear that how science is applied even in more uh, normal contexts, requires public debate. It shouldn't be decided just by scientists themselves. But scientists, as citizens, have a special responsibility to engage in that debate. And they should try to foster benign uses, benign spin-offs of their work, commercial or otherwise, but they should resist, as far as they can, dubious or threatening applications of their work. They should alert the public and alert politicians to perceive dangers. That's their responsibility. And now, of course, one can do all the things that Russell did, but we can do other things. Campaigns via blogging and social media can catalyze a debate that's much wider and better informed. And whatever careers you take up, you have expertise that's relevant in doing this. And speaking again to the uh, uh, students here, even without Mr. Kurzweil's nostrums, many of you will live to the end of this century. It may be a bumpy ride. I've highlighted the anxieties. But 
An optimistic note is that there seems no scientific impediment to achieving a sustainable world where all of us enjoy a lifestyle better than we in the West do today. So I'm a real technological optimist. But I'm a political pessimist. The intractable politics of sociology, the gap between potentialities and what actually happens, does engender pessimism. Politicians look to their own voters and the next election. Stockholders expect a payoff in the short run. And we downplay what's happening even now in faraway countries, and we discount too heavily the problems we leave for new generations. Without a broader perspective, the public will never be adequately motivated to stem the risk of environmental degradation, to prioritize clean energy and sustainable agriculture, and to handle the Promethean challenge posed by ever more powerful technology. Our government promotes its current economic policies by claiming that we're all in this together. Many of us are rather cynical about this, of course, but it's not cynical to say that we are all on this crowded earth together. We are stewards of a precious pale blue dot in a vast cosmos, a planet with a future measured in billions of years. And it's up to us this century what happens to it. And before handing over to John, I want to finish with a quote from a BBC talk by a more recent scientific sage than Bertrand Russell, the biologist Peter Medawar. He said, I quote, the bells that toll for mankind are like the bells of alpine cattle. They are attached to our own necks. And it is our fault if they do not make a tuneful and melodious sound. Thank you very much. Good evening. Uh, While well, I'm setting this up, um, my general uh, presentation strategy is to uh, prepare like one presentation per year or so and then give it at many places in order to kind of dilute the cost. And so about uh, a year ago, I uh, had the idea that, uh, well, wait a minute, a lot of uh, people, students and and entrepreneurs want me to talk about Skype. And, but I'm not that interested in talking about Skype. It's like decade-old technology. Uh, so uh, perhaps I should develop uh, like a Trojan horse of a presentation. Uh, like, so I would like ostensibly talk about Skype, but uh, um, it's really not about Skype, as, you, as you're about to see. Also, like, in order to get quicker to the Q&A session, I uh, shortened this. Uh, presentation a little bit. There's actually a longer version on YouTube if you're interested in, in more fleshed out version. Uh, so the talk uh, comprises uh, five theses. Uh, the first thesis is that the future is fragile uh, because it is shaped by individual actions of a surprisingly small number of people. To show what I mean, let's zoom right back to the year 2002. A small group was celebrating the news uh, that their software was declared responsible for the majority of the internet's traffic. The party took place in a small apartment in an old Soviet-style apartment block in Tallinn. I'm, of course, talking about the team that built the file-sharing software Kazaa. Less than two years later, a largely overlapping group was posing for a photo shoot uh, for a Fortune magazine cover story. Their latest creation, Skype, was less than four months old. One year before the photo shoot, Toivo who later became the head of engineering, sent this email to Nikos and Janos, the main duo uh, behind Skype. After investigating various voice over IP programs out there, Toivo concluded that none of them worked properly. So he suggested that we should develop our own protocol and client. Eight months later, we had launched the first version of Skype. Talk about good timing. 2003 was the year where laptop sales surpassed desktop sales and also the voice-capable broadband was taking off. People who have played Civilization should realize what this picture represents. That's right, it's a technology tree. New developments always, new technology always leans on uh, existing technology, thus forming a graph of dependencies. 
Now it is important though to, to realize that new technology does not appear automatically once its prerequisites are in place because some inventor still has to come up with the idea. And sometimes ideas can linger for hundreds, if not thousands of years, waiting to be discovered. My favorite example there is hot air balloons. They were invented by, by the Montgolfier brothers of France uh, in around uh, 1782. However, the enabling technology for them had been in place for thousands of years, waiting for the inventor. Furthermore, as the technology gets more powerful, their timing matters more. Now think about what the world would look like if the nuclear weapons had been created just a couple of decades earlier or later. Even worse, as uh, Professor Max Tegmark, who is an advisor to uh, Caesar, has pointed out, we got lucky that the laws of physics made nuclear weapons hard to construct. We might not be so lucky with the next massively destructive technology. So that is what I mean when I say that the future is for fragile. The future is sensitive to the timing and order in which new technologies are introduced. Also, the historical turns get more dramatic as the technology gets more powerful. And ultimately, inventions are stemming from the thoughts and actions of individual people. People like Toivo sending that email proposing a new voice over IP protocol. The rest of my presentation is how, how about you should behave when you find yourself at the crossroads of technological progress moment where our entire future might depend on your actions. First of all, you should be careful not to be an amoeba. A friend of mine put it, once put it very cynically. Technology developers, he said, are like amoeba, following the trail of money and status with a justification mechanism bolted on top. What he meant by that was that it is often easy to simply do what the feeds intuitively justified without thinking about the actual consequences of your actions. For instance, it's easy to follow so-called expert consensus because people seldom blame you for doing that. But the expert consensus is often wrong. In Skype's case, the expert consensus initially dismissed it as a toy. For example, a renowned internet expert wrote back then that by using a homegrown web protocol, Skype was bringing a knife to gunfight. So following express is, is less useful uh, than one might think. But what about social signals, such as opinions of your peers and so-called common sense? Well, as illustrated by this wonderful cartoon about stock market, popular opinion and peer pressure are just, vulnerable, just as vulnerable to imitation and meme propagation as expert opinion is. If you can't see it, it reads, I've got a stock here that could really excel. And people overhearing, really excel? Excel, sell, 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 until one of them goes, ah, oh, this is madness, I can't take it anymore. Goodbye. And then people go, goodbye, bye, bye, bye. So following common beliefs is uh, not good either. What about money? Well, money is usually awarded by the economy. However, the secret with the economy is that there's a man behind the curtain, or at least an invisible hand. If you're lucky, the economy is ruled by the free market, and having grown up in the Soviet Union, I know how, how to appreciate that. The nice thing about the free economy is that it approximates human values, because if you make products that people want, the market will reward you. However, we should not forget that both the economy and the free market are human social institutions whose laws have, an, have a, a limited domain. For example, a super intelligent AI that is able to rearrange atoms at will is not going to be constrained by human economy. That's why I'm never convinced by an economical or social argument or how about something is impossible. Unless something is ruled out by the laws of physics, it is possible. So don't be an amoeba. Blindly following the crumb trail of money and social status will not guarantee a better future. Instead, look behind the incentives. Try to understand the mechanisms that generated them and be conscious of where they are actually leading you. So what would be a good alternative to the amoeba trail? Which trail should you follow? Well, ideally you should try to maximize your positive impact. That is, pick your actions based on their expected effects on the world. Let me illustrate this with another personal example. 1st of September, 2005, Janos had just flown in from London to discuss the decision to sell Skype. To avoid being overheard, we had to retreat to the office parking lot. Of course, this topic wasn't new. Uh, we had met various suitors before. 
For example, here are Google's uh, M&A representatives teaching us drinking games in the spring of 2005. <laughs> Google did not agree to pay the asking price, though, but another company did. I think you'll learn a lot from us, but I think we'll learn a lot from you, too. So, welcome to eBay, and congratulations yeah. to this guy. Yeah. 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 Cheers. Cheers. Bitches. <laughs> and if you guys, you know, when we leave my team here, the Jefferson here tonight, is, uh, <laughs> we do the famous five stages. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell me about it. And All the, right. the Milli Miley Kasha. Mm. <laughs> and the what? Now, had I followed my new amoeba, advice myself. Not really. Luckily, my trail did not lead, lead to a disaster. It became very clear, though, that I had been on rails, so to speak, because it was not obvious at all what should I do next. And even remember a friend of mine asking, so Jan, how does it feel having your life's work done at such an early age? Implying that it's all downhill from here. <laughs> After some soul searching, I came to realize that I really care about maximizing my positive impact on the world. But how do you make deliberate progress towards such an abstract goal? Well, here's a model that I ended up with. Picture the action of fastening your seatbelt. Because the future is uncertain, there is no guarantee that the seatbelt will actually help you. It might make things even worse. Yet, on average, fastening your seatbelt is still a positive action. It reduces the number of negative scenarios while increasing the number of positive ones. So this is what I mean when I say that an action has a positive impact. Now, in order to maximize the impact, one should go from saving your own life to saving a lot of lives, possibly the entire planet. If you recall what I said earlier about the future being fragile, it should not surprise you that, in my view, the global equivalent to fastening the safety belt is try to shape the technology tree to minimize the risks and maximize opportunities for the entire humanity. So, to that effect, I'm supporting a growing ecosystem of organizations, 80,000 hours among them, uh, that are doing research or, or otherwise supportive uh, of, uh, of the research, uh, how to survive, and tap, survive the risks and tap into opportunities. I call it the X-Risk ecosystem. Because there is no automatic MIBA trail leading towards such research, very few people are doing it, as Ben estimated, perhaps 20. Therefore, if you want to multiply your positive impact on the world, Supporting or even creating X-Risk organizations is an easy way to do so. So in my view, instead of Amoeba Trail, you should try to follow the path that leads you to the biggest possible positive impact. Which in the context of technology development means predicting the effects of our inventions and minimizing scenarios where the technology ends up harming people, either accidentally or deliberately. That is, error or terror scenarios, as Martin Rees here puts it. Now, the impact trail has one problem. It relies on predictions. And as Niels Bohr once famously quipped, prediction is very difficult, especially about the future. <laughs> Luckily, there is a way to reduce reliance on precise predictions. The way to re reduce reliance on predictions is to be humble in a technological sense, as de defined by American AI researcher and co-founder of the Machine Intelligence Research Institute that came up earlier today, Eliezer Jotkowski. To be humble, he said, is to take specific actions in anticipation of your own future errors. Let me illustrate this with another story from Skype. We used to be rather smug about the frequent outages that our competitors had. After all, it was impossible to have global outage in a peer-to-peer -peer network such as Skype, right? Then, of course, the August 16, 2007 happened. It took us half a day just to realize that the laws of physics didn't include peer-to-peer -peer architectures guaranteeing infinite uptime. When the realization finally dawned upon us, the core technical team was in for two memorable days and nights trying to rescue the Skype network. And here's a sample of what went on in the so-called war room. <laughs> Yeah. 
So after that moment, it still took us about half a day to get the network operational. Uh, unfortunately, in order to save time, I, I actually cut out the explanation uh, of what exactly happened because it's just technical explanation, but you can look it up on YouTube. Uh, so did you notice the list on the whiteboard? Uh, when Skype's chief architect, Ahti, started to investigate what was going on, he compiled a special version of Skype, SuperNode, Skype SuperNode, and ran it on his own computer, home computer. As a result, it wasn't his computer that crashed, nor was it his network connection. Instead, the storm of traffic towards him took down his entire internet service provider. <laughs> there were a couple more ISPs that died that night, even though we warned them before we put up Skype network servers in their domain. And they seemed sure that the systems could take it. Clearly, the lack of humility wasn't only Skype's problem. However, a lack of humility is also inexcusable if there's a lot at stake. Unforeseen things happen. So if you're inventing powerful technology or technology that others rely on, you must take concrete actions in advance, such as building in lots of safety margins. Also, please question our assumptions and ideally try to make our actions reversible. So be humble to contract the uncertainty in your predictions. More specifically, remember that reality can be more imaginative than you are, and use safety margins, question your assumptions, and have a plan for reversing your actions. Now, finally, there is one more topic to cover. What kind of future should you be aiming for? Apparently, this question gets very tricky once you get beyond the obvious saving lives scenarios. As moral philosophers, and there's an abundance of them here, uh, in Cambridge can tell you, we simply don't have a final answer to what we humans really want. Luckily, there is a solid heuristic, maximize the amount of fun in the world. Since more fun is almost always better than less fun. A good strategy to start with is to have fun yourself and be fun to other people. Now remember that uh, Fortune magazine story. It was titled, Catch Us If You Can, and it started like this. Near the center of the walled medieval district of Estonia's capital, Tallinn, sits the Noku Bar. In Estonian, Noku is an acronym for young culture. The private club is full of 20-somethings in jeans, drinking local beer with rock music. The bar's name has another meaning. Read as one word, it's slang for penis. <laughs> Both the hidden nature and the cheeky attitude of the place fit perfectly with the company I'm here to meet. Indeed, Skypers were cheeky and weird but always in a fun, maximizing way. For instance, let's take Skype's leaders. Remember the eBay welcome dinner video? The man saying that he didn't want to know if his team went on to do the five-phase Skype night was eBay's chief operating officer. Well, this is Michael, Skype's chief operating officer at the time. 
And this is Niklas while being sued by the music industry for, quote, aiding and abetting massive music piracy. <laughs> this is Skype's management team on a panel discussion. And this is Toivo showing off his, his leadership and resource management skills. <laughs> Some more pictures from Skype parties. Ah, this is, well, too complicated to explain, but... Uh, and some of the pictures I really can't show from that party, but uh, uh, let's just say that uh, Skype's hidden pool party emoticon was based on real-world events. This is a party where people ended up dancing on tables and walls, and uh, local staff seemed to form a rather distinct opinion of Skypers. <laughs> but don't get me wrong, Skypers did not need to party in order to be quirky and have fun. For example, here on the left is uh, business development lead, uh, Scott, at the strategy meeting in the morning. And this is him in the evening, continuing the discussion via other methods. His target is Skype's first employee, Tavet. Oh, here he's just being his normal self in the office. This is head of development, Stefan. He's using a doll to illustrate the difficulties in running the development team while other teams are stealing his resources. And here is Skype's general counsel, Rob, playing the role of Fortuna in a credit card roulette after a dinner in an expensive Michelin star restaurant. Now, have you noticed how nice it is when the pilots of your airplane sound cheerful over the intercom? Similarly, one reason why it helps to have technology developers to be, to be quirky, quirky and fun-loving is that it is in everyone's interest to have the future to be shaped by people who appreciate life. The value of fun goes much deeper, though. You see, while positive emotions like happiness and pleasure are important, they leave the world outside massively underspecified because they refer to subjective states of mind, and there are various shortcuts one can take to achieve them, such as taking drugs or meditating. In contrast, fun usually refers to objective processes in the external world. So when optimizing for fun, there are fewer shortcuts, then, and hence the chance of unintended consequences is much smaller. One intuitive way to see that is to look at uh, what makes a good game design. A good game is optimized to be maximally fun versus maximally addictive or happy, whatever that means. Like a good game, we want our future to be maximally fun, offer a lot of progress and excitement, but probably also a fair share of setbacks and challenges for contrast. So this, that is what I mean when I say that fun is fundamental. You can create happiness out of fun, but not fun out of happiness. Therefore, I urge you to be fun, have fun, and increase the amount of fun in the world. So that is pretty much what I had to say. If I could leave you with just one more picture, a picture to compress my entire talk into one slide, it would be this. Technology development is like a steering wheel. When turning it, don't be an amoeba. Instead, be humble and head for the mountains of fun. And don't forget, the entire world is riding in the back. Thank you. Uh, thank you to our speakers. We have uh, about 20 minutes for questions now, which are going to be chaired by Hugh. And then just a quick reminder, please fill out the feedback forms on your, on, on your desk. And then there's a free drinks reception in the Allison Richard building. Uh, if you want to find out where that is, go out to the lobby and there'll be people there to show you the way. Ben, do we, do we have a roving mic? Or do, do um, we... Yeah. Okay. Sean, do... Should be do... one on the way. Okay, so there, there, there's a roving mic on the way, but um, while we're waiting for that, is there somebody with a reasonably loud voice who would like to ask the first question? Yes, sir. What is your favorite terrifying existential risk? My one, I, I think, I, I mean, we want to emphasize that, that, that we're not picking favorites. I mean, some, some of the coverage that we've got, some of the media coverage, has given the impression that we're just concerned about the robots taking over. Uh, we, we want to emphasize that, that that's not the case and the kinds of risks that we're talking about. Um, I, I mean, the foreseeable possibilities are in at least three areas, as, as I mentioned. There's the IT, 
um, biotechnology and nanotechnology. And there are almost certainly ones that we haven't foreseen yet because the technologies just haven't come along. Um, as a philosopher, the one I find most fascinating, in some sense also the most scary, is the IT one. Because I do think that there's quite a strong case for thinking that the planet as a whole is on, relatively speaking, on the verge of a really remarkable transition, which is the transition that happens when intelligence escapes from organic forms and comes to exist in other forms, and is hence free of lots of restrictions that it has in organic forms. I mean, restrictions due to speed and capacity and so on. I think that whatever happens, that's going to be one of the biggest things that's ever happened, not just to us, but to this planet. Um, and so, even if, even if you're a total optimist, I, I think that it's, that in particular is, is worth thinking about very hard at this stage in our development. Also, I would say that uh, the thing about AI risk is that uh, it's the only existential risk that has uh, a uh, very strong positive side. If things go right, they, they will go very right in the sense that it can be actually used, AI can be used to address the other, other risks and, and other, other problems that they might have. Therefore, it's a kind of double-edged sword uh, and, and can be used to maximize a positive impact, which is important. Yes, that's going to be my follow-up. What do you think about using AI to mitigate yep. the other risks? It turns out it's pe people who have actually thought about it, turns out it's really, really, really hard to use AI for, for positive uh, uh, impact in the long run because it, the, 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 the target that we have to hit, have to hit with, with, with AI is very, very small uh, while we, in order to actually be confident that once it's out there and builds new AIs, that build new AIs, that build new AIs, it's going to do the right thing. Sorry? Even if you've got a genie, you don't know what to wish for. Yeah, exactly. Okay, let's move on. Um, the person in, in, in the middle here, in the second row of the second block. Uh, thanks for the presentations. Uh, during one of the talks, the point was raised that regulation is now very difficult and maybe unprecedentedly difficult because if something can be developed, it will be developed somewhere. So if regulation is difficult, if we can quantify these risks, how do we actually mitigate them or reduce them? Yes. Well, I made this unhelpful remark that I am pessimistic about the effectiveness of regulation uh, in this context. Um, I think uh, um, this is just one instance of uh, uh, the growing difficulty of governance. I think the big problem is going to be that small groups can be more disruptive and more empowered, and I think it's going to get more and more difficult. And I think um, that's why it is so important for people to be aware of the difficulties. There's no easy answer at all, and I just think it's going to be very hard to regulate, and we've got to accept that most of these things that we are scared of will be done by someone somewhere. That's pessimistic but realistic, I think. It's a question from Martin Rees. <laughs> Um, what do you make of the fact that we've not yet found any evidence for intelligent life anywhere else in the universe? Do you think that suggests that the hope of stopping ourselves annihilating our, our, our species is actually uh, uh, unattainable? Because presumably elsewhere in Andromeda, Nebula, whatever, they'll also have had CSA, they'll also have had um, committees trying to prevent themselves destroying each other, and yet um, no evidence that anyone's yet succeeded. Yes. Um, well, of course, uh, um, uh, we don't know how likely it is that there's even simple life elsewhere, nor do we know how likely it is that simple life will become intelligent. But it, indeed, there is this famous uh, uh, puzzle about why the aliens aren't here already if there are lots of them, because some would have uh, uh, evolved on uh, planets that formed a billion years before our sun formed and therefore would have a head start. So indeed, one idea um, is that there is some sort of uh, um, uh, so-called filter which stops uh, any intelligence getting beyond a certain level. Um, uh, it could be that there's a filter at an earlier stage. It could be that uh, simple life doesn't evolve into anything as complicated as us. We just don't know. Um, so I, I just think uh, we've got to search for evidence for life, try to understand how life began, um, and also not be too anthropomorphic because we uh, realize that uh, AI, uh, if it's developed, 
is going to be completely alien, have completely different goals from human beings. That's one of the reasons why it's so dangerous. And, of course, uh, any uh, life that evolved elsewhere in the universe would be at least as alien as AI that uh, arises on the Earth. So I think we've got to be entirely open-minded. Also, there is a, like a complex uh, an anthropic uh, argument to be made there. As my good friend Michael Vassar said, that uh, uh, like even if life has this tendency of, of building uh, more and more powerful technologies and then end up ending up by colonizing and and uh, colonizing the entire ga galaxy or entire universe, if you are early life in that scale, you should still expect yourself to find yourself at a place where it hasn't done so. Well, I think to, to put a footnote to that, um, it could be that life is. Uh, uh, unique to the Earth, or advanced life is. But the other thing we learn as astronomers is that uh, the time lying ahead is as long as the time that's elapsed up till now. So we are not the culmination of evolution. Even on Earth, there's time for uh, as much uh, further evolution. And that evolution is going to be faster, because it's going to be on a technological time scale, not a Darwinian selection time scale. So uh, the future of, uh, uh, of life and maybe it'll be um, inorganic or unorganic, um, is uh, more prolonged and probably far more wonderful than what's happened up to now. And that's why uh, in um, this philosophical question of what we are losing by snuffing out all life now, we're snuffing out that potentiality perhaps as well. Could I ask you hold up hands um, for a little while and I'll line up a couple to streamline this. So I see hands here, 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 here. Okay. Hi, my question is sim similar to your last comment on kind of time scale and also reflection. That I think a lot of times we talk about the history of this from nuclear weapons through the present. So for each of you, have been focused on this for a while. How has your thinking changed in the last five or ten years? Where have you been wrong in the last few years? And kind of how does that help you understand where you think we might be going in the future? Uh, so rather than just taking the 60 or 70 year view, just looking at the last five or ten years and how has your thinking evolved? My, my, my thinking tends to kind of uh, fluctuate as, as I uh, learn more and more interesting considerations about, uh, about the future. Uh, so it's like it, it probably would take me too long time to actually give a, like a comprehensive answer, answer here. But uh, there is an interesting uh, uh, paper that the Future Humanity Institute did uh, about uh, how, how hard it is to create uh, uh, superhuman intelligence using brain uploading. So, like, uh, and it, the inter interesting thing about the brain uploading is that it's a technology that can be analyzed. You can look at, at the trends of uh, of how quickly the uh, microscopes are getting getting more powerful and how, how quickly the more slow is advancing computers, and then like extrapolate from there. And they did actually a Monte Carlo simulation that gave a distribution uh, of uh, when exactly, or what is the chance of getting uh, brain uploads. Uh, given a year on this century. So this is like, a, a, I think, an interesting work that has kind of, a, is actually rooted in reality and, and analyzes when, points out that there are significant uh, chances of getting uh, uh, like completely disrupted technology this, this century. And this is just one technology. I think the one thing I've learned as I've got older is how bad we are predicting things. The more you watch events change over the decade, you realize that uh, uh, the direction is unpredictable and the speed even more unpredictable. And I think we just have to be open-minded. And that's why I think we've got to explore all these scenarios, even those that seem a bit crazy, because they may happen quicker than we think. And I think the, the big change in my thinking is the, is the one I already told you about when, um, as a result of that um, cab ride in, in Copenhagen. I. I, I found myself in the kind of position that Jan had on his final slide of realizing that, that my pers personal road or amoeba trail or whatever it was had an exit for it. And, and, and there, there, there seemed to be increasingly vivid lights flashing and saying, go this way, go this way, go this way, this is more fun. And that was the, 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 um, the exit which led us here. So that's the, that's the big change in my thinking. Question here. Thanks. Uh, David Cleveley, uh, founding director of the Center for Science and Policy. Thank you very much for the name check earlier. Very pleased to have uh, helped you with this. 
Um, I've got a practical question, which is, given that, um, in particular, Lord Rees, you are a political pessimist, um, what kind of governance structures do you think we're going to need to be able to deal with this at a, at a practical level for the planet? And are those governance structures going to have to be specific to each risk, or can we have something that copes with everything? Well, I express pessimism, and uh, I have no easy solutions. We all know what the trends are. Uh, the trends are that uh, a small group can be more disruptive than ever before, um, and uh, uh, many of the issues we want to address um, transcend national boundaries, um, and uh, many of the uh, uh, common interest groups transcend national boundaries through uh, uh, modern media. So uh, everything is a very complicated matrix where traditional national boundaries become less and less relevant and less and less effective. And we do need to bear in mind that even very small groups can potentially have a huge impact. That's just saying how difficult it's going to be. I don't have a solution, but I think this is something we do need to worry about. And my view is that it's, uh, although, although I don't have a very strong view there, uh, in fact, my model of governments is pretty poor. I don't know, know exactly what's going on. Uh, so, but. Uh, like, as like one kind of corollary of uh, what Martin says, that uh, that the future is going to be like, increasingly in the hands of uh, less and fewer and fewer people, it becomes more feasible to just to talk to them, like, identify all of them, and and, and network. Which is, this is one of the things that I'm trying to do. Hence, hence my like investments in AI companies and 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 uh, just. Uh, hang around in the kitchens of AI companies, which I have done. <laughs> and I, th I think that, 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 that that model is probably to some extent a general one. David, you asked whether, whether it, the answers were likely to be risk specific or not. It seems to me that that particular one, which you might call a self-governance model, where, you, where you, try, you try and encourage developers within the, the individual technologies to think in the way that, that Jan was recommending, to think about their consequences of their actions. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems to me that in some ways that may well be a more promising model than, than a model which requires new structures at, 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 at the level of governance at the other end of, of states or, or, st or state cooperation. That said, the governments still have ridiculous resources. Therefore, therefore it's, it's like if there is a good way to to somehow utilize those resources to actually lower the risks, then that would be really great, I think. Okay, I think we've got time for two or three more questions. There was one up here. Can I see hands again? Okay, one here, one up there. Okay. Uh, Robert Henderson, um, Imperial College London. So, um, so I'm actually um, an AI researcher. I recently completed a PhD in AI. And um, I just want to say that um, this, this kind of debate on the uh, potential risks of advanced AI um, is, is a very welcome thing, because I think it has, for, what, for whatever reason, um, perhaps due to the history of the field, there, there's a tendency for AI researchers really not to, not to talk too much uh, about the long-term risks possibly because they don't want to seem too big-headed to say that their research is contributing to something uh, that's so extraordinarily impressive as sort of um, human-level artificial intelligence. There's tendency to be sort of more modest. Um, so, so I want to say this is very welcome. But one, one question I have is, do you think that, ha have we reached a, a period in, in the history of science where where there's, there are some kinds of, where it's not always good to have more knowledge, because uh, um, up till now it's generally been regarded by scientists that knowledge is always good, ignorance is bad. So therefore, as, lo as long as I'm encouraging, encouraging knowledge, it's, it's up to other people to, to decide whether or not it's risky. Is, is, this, is this something that no longer holds? Do scientists need yeah, well, to have Well, yes, and, and there, uh, there, there's, there's, obviously there's been relevant recent debate about that precise issue, in, including, I think, the, the example that Martin mentioned about the, 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 the discovery of, of what would be necessary to make the, the bird flu virus transmissible to humans. And, and so, of course, in this issue, that in, in this area, there are going to be issues about 
whether there's a case for restricting knowledge in dangerous cases, and if so, whether it's possible to do that. I mean, because you know, one, one, of, one of the byproducts of uh, the, the wonderful technology that we have in the form of the internet and so on is that it, it, it makes knowledge so easily available. But so, of course, these are important questions. Thanks. Uh, hi, Jan, when you say have fun, um, is there like anything actionable you have in mind? Like is there, <laughs> oh, yeah, is there like a research going on into exactly what kind of thing we want that to be? That is a really good question. Uh, hmm. I think you have to watch the longer version of the talk on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, uh, yeah, I mean, I have certainly, like, just, as I've gotten older, I've discovered I discovered the value of actually thinking about what is fun and, and, and uh, like trying to uh, kind of actively figure out things that things are fun and just do more of those. Uh, but uh, I'm, now that you mention it, I'm actually not aware, aware of uh, what is the, is there like a fun research? Eliezer Rutkowski has written uh, a sort of series of uh, blog posts called uh, Fun theory, I think, uh, on on lesswrong.com. So, like, I, I read those, and and so it's like this is the closest uh, thing to to fun uh, fun research that I, that I've read. Okay, I'm afraid we're um, we're now over time. It would be wonderful to be able to continue this discussion, um, but um, I'd like to invite all of you to come over to Crash in the Alison Richards Building, which is just about 100. And uh, 50 meters immediately to the north of here um, and there'll be um, drinks and refreshments and we can continue the discussion in that more informal way. But before we finish, I'd just like to ask you to join me in um, thanking all the people who've made this event possible. Um, I, I, I hope I won't forget anyone. Um, um, Jacob Treverthin from um, 80,000 Hours Cambridge. Um, Catherine and Michelle, particularly from Crash. Um, ben here for coming over from Oxford to cheer it for us. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, oh, and of, of, of course, th thank you, Ben. Uh, it, it, Sean O'Hegarty, our wonderful um, academic project manager in CESA, um, who um, is, is someone we now couldn't do without. So thank you, all of you. <laughs>